All right, good afternoon, everyone. Um, and welcome uh, all of you here uh, in the audience, as well as our, our viewers uh, joining us online via Facebook live stream. Uh, my name is Russell Shao. I am the executive director here at the Global Taiwan Institute. GTI is a 501c3 think tank dedicated to Taiwan policy research and related programs. Our mission is to enhance the U.S.-Taiwan relationship and Taiwan with the world by contributing to a more informed public discussion about Taiwan. In pursuit of that mission, we undertake several major programs. They include a bi-weekly publication called the Global Taiwan Brief, where we feature timely analysis related to Taiwan. Uh, we have some graduate students or professionals uh, interested in contributing to the publication. Please feel free to reach out to us. Um, you can contact any one of our uh, staff members to uh, find the correct uh, email address to, to send your interest, uh, to express your interest to. Uh, we also organize regular public seminars like the one that you are participating in today uh, to highlight certain issues related to Taiwan that uh, have policy relevance. We also organize an annual symposium uh, uh, in the fall where we uh, invite leading policymakers as well as academics in the field to assess the current state and future of U.S.-Taiwan relations. In addition to these research uh, and academic uh, focused programs, we also offer fellowship opportunities uh, for uh, scholar, American scholars to go to Taiwan to conduct short-term field research as well as uh, Taiwanese uh, scholars, young scholars, activists to come to the United States for short-term field research. Uh, so if you're not already subscribed to receive our updates, you may do so on our website at www.globaltaiwan.org. And before we begin today's program, I just want to, again, acknowledge the support of our co-founders as well as our, our board of directors and our advisors, uh, many of whom are in this room today, uh, for your support for our programs, uh, as well as the staff and interns uh, of GTI who make all our programs, of course, possible. Um, so let's begin today's program. Uh, the People's Republic of China, uh, economic as well as political footprint, is going global. And there are increasing public scrutiny uh, of Beijing's massive loan and aid programs for both good governance and security. In part, China is utilizing its development aid program strategically in some regions of the world to poach Taiwan's diplomatic allies and isolate it internationally. But in addition to this cross-strait dimension, there are evidence, growing evidence found that these Chinese loans and aids, which are part of its strategic One Belt, One Road initiative, are means of what some observers would call the trap diplomacy that can hold at risk the recipient's sovereignty and challenges the existing norms and values of the liberal world order. Uh, it's perhaps reminding ourselves uh, that the U.S. free and open Indo-Pacific strategy highlights good governance as a key component of, uh, of the strategy, but it's also important to remind ourselves that development is also an important component of this free and open Indo-Pacific strategy. As Secretary Pompeo stated in his uh, July 2018 uh, address at the Indo-Pacific Business Forum, by economically, open means fair and, and reciprocal trade, open investment environments, transparent agreements between nations, and improved connectivity to drive regional ties, because these are the paths for sustainable growth in the region. Now, how Taiwan uh, is facing this challenge which is both unique to itself, but also shared by other like-minded countries concerned about the impact of China's rise. What is Taiwan doing with its own official development assistance? And are there more effective, effective ways for Taiwan to respond to PRC pressure on, the, uh, on its international space? More broadly, are there opportunities for more coordinated collaboration among like-minded donors to ensure that development aids and loans further good governance and also benefit the people of the recipient countries. Now we have a panel of experts that will address the topics of Taiwan's ODA, how Taiwan's ODA is applied to the Latin America and Caribbean region, and the function of ODA in U.S. foreign policy, and prospects for uh, more, more collaboration. This event is the, uh, the first installment of the Civil Society and Democracy series, uh, which is partially funded by the Taiwan Foundation uh, for mm -hmm. Democracy. 
So you have uh, their, um, our panel, this is Miles, so I won't go into too many details. But to my immediate left, we have uh, Kryson Chen, who is a professor of geography, environment, and development studies at the National Taiwan University. Dr. Chen is also an advisor uh, to the Taiwan Alliance of International Development, which is a civic association advocating concepts of international development and cooperation from a viewpoint of non-governmental organizations. To his left, we have Scott Harrell, who is an associate director of the RAND Center for Asia Pacific Policy. He's also a senior political scientist at RAND Corporation. Uh, he just published a very timely report, co-authored with uh, Lyle Morris and Logan Ma, uh, which is titled, quote, Countering China's Efforts to Isolate Taiwan Diplomatically in Latin America and the Caribbean, the Role of Development Assistance and Disaster Relief. And today's event is actually, I think, the rollout, the first time speaking publicly about this. So thank you very much for choosing GTI as a venue for, uh, for, this, uh, for this discussion on this report. Last but not least, we have uh, to his left, Patrick Cronin, who holds the Hudson Institute's Asia Pacific Security Chair. He was previously the Senior Advisor and Senior Director of the Asia Pacific Security Program at the Center for New American Security, uh, uh, New American Security among other many postings. But perhaps most relevant to our discussion today, Dr. Cronin also served as the Assistant Administrator for Policy and Program Coordination at the U.S. Uh, Agency for International Development, USAID. So uh, what I've asked the, each of the panelists to do is to provide an opening statement. Uh, first, we'll have uh, Kryson cover Taiwan's ODA program, its transformation, followed by uh, Scott, who will uh, talk about his report, which applies uh, Taiwan's ODA to Latin America and Caribbean region, and followed by some um, uh, uh, with Patrick's expert um, reaction, uh, you know, to the uh, how ODA fa functions in U.S. foreign policy, but also more broadly looking at how there might be more coordinated uh, collaboration among uh, like-minded donors. So, uh, Kryson, yes. I'll hand this over to you. Uh, maybe I just can turn off my computer over there. Maybe you can take a look at some of the pictures. That would be easier. <laughs> yeah. And we'll do that. We're going to see over there. Okay. Well, it's not going to go on the screen. It's actually just, yeah, for some of the technical reasons. Uh, yeah. And thank you very much for the Russians inviting me to come over to here for the sharing my research about the ODA in Taiwan and then what we call the A of from the uh, NGO. So I might have the chance to have a more speech about the, from the NGO viewpoint, but today we'll be more focused on the ODA. And the point of my topic is about the Taiwan's ODA in transition. So I would like to let you know about why my view is about the transitions. So the, I give you some of my very briefly uh, ideas first. It's about if you identify the, the ODA policy to always relate to the foreign policy. But if you identify the foreign policy in the whole world about the relation to Taiwan, you might identify the two kind, four cells, the two by two. The one is the non-OECD countries. The other one is the OECD countries, or the big country of big power. And the other dimension is the diplomatic alliances, or non-diplomatic alliances. So four two by two actually become the four categories. The number one is the, you are the OECD countries with the diplomatic alliances with Taiwan, that is North countries in that kind of the categories. The other one is the non-OECD countries that the diplomatic alliance with Taiwan, such as the country, the president I had visited the Marshall Islands, the Palau, the, that uh, in the Pacific Islands. And the other one is the non-OECD country and the non-diplomatic alliance that is the main countries in Southeast Asia. That is the countries that we are focusing on the Southbound policies. And the last one is the non the diplomatic alliances, but with the OECD countries, let's say, for example, America, for example, the French government, for example, a, a lot of the Norwegian government, so on and so forth. So that is the idea, thinking to me, uh, for us to think about the interplay between the foreign policy and foreign aid policy. It gives this in mind first, and then we'll tell you later on. And why I always mention about the OECD is because OECD that has another very important organization it's called about the Development Assistance Committee, DAC. And DAC is partly kind of the most important organizations in the world to in charge of the 
A principle in charge of the A philosophy, in charge of the A effectiveness, all kind of the research and then the evaluations. So that I try to argue is actually Taiwan is something different, uh, not just only focusing on their uh, diplomatic alliance the countries, not only focusing on the southbound countries, but also has a very interaction with the uh, DAC countries. Okay. And then give you some of the, the, the pictures is about the Taiwan actually uh, cooperate with the UNICEF, the UN Children Fund, and then the other one, the UNHCR is the Human High Commission on Human Rights uh, Refugee Issues. And then another one is the International Medical and Cooperation Corps. This is a very important international organization. Uh, some is, of course, is related to the UN. And you see these pictures, is one is with the Taiwan flag, and then is the UN UNICEF. The other one is uh, the, that is the Taiwan flag, also with the uh, INF International Medical Corps. And the third one is the the, the Taiwan flag, also with the UNIS, uh, UNHCR. And those are real pictures. And those are in Jordan, and in uh, Iraq, in north part of the Iraq, in Turkish. Okay. So what happened to that? And that is also the one of the very important uh, uh, signals, uh, as some of you might also <laughs> recognize, uh, Taiwan actually is listed as the global alliance of the uh, defeats of the ISIS. Also, because of that, so Taiwan ambassador to America also invited uh, to the uh, state councils uh, for the, some of the speech. So how to understand this kind of the foreign aid or foreign ODA in transition in Taiwan? The last one is about the now is uh, ICDF is the International Cooperation and Development Foundation of Taiwan. They has a uh, certain different projects that uh, cooperate with the Mercy Corps, cooperate with the Asian Against the Hunger. Asian Against Hunger actually is the French organization of the development agency. And then they have a certain kind of uh, projects uh, not only in Jordan but also in Pakistan. Pakistan is certainly not an uh, alliance of Taiwan. And Jordan is also not a diplomatic alliance of Taiwan. And we have the projects. And more important is that we have the projects that cooperate with the UN organizations, cooperate with the American development agencies, and then the French development agencies. So I think that has a certain kind of the Taiwan ODA in transitions. The very beginning is that Taiwan received a lot of the aid from Americans. And then right now, uh, and then Taiwan southern uh, very soon just become over the aid to the Africa countries and then the Latin American countries. That is what we call about the Taiwan actually is the model from the aid recipient to become the aid donors. And then is the in the recent days they had a certain kind of the what we call about the conventional triang triangle cooperation. Is the south northern part of the north part of the countries, north countries such as the OECD countries, cooperate with the one of the south countries in another third, third countries. The, the one of the example is Japan, cooperate with the Brazil, doing some of the development projects in Mozambique. Okay, the both are our languages, languages countries. So Japan cooperate with the Brazil in Mozambique. And but the case of Taiwan is Taiwan actually cooperated together with the, as I said before, is the UNICEF and the UNHCR and then the other Mercy Corps and other organizations in Jordan, in Pakistan, this kind of another country. So I think that is the Taiwan as part of the global partnership in development projects. That is the very new things just only happening about just only one decade, and that is deserved our attention more uh, than before. So. Uh, So in that sense, the actually the had the two ideological camp in terms of the international development. The number one is what they call about the South South cooperation. That is something from the Bandung Principles. The Bandung Principles is uh, in the 1955. That is certain uh, is Indonesia. That is the first uh, uh, world conferences between the African and then the Asia. And in that sense, they are more about the equity. And not more about the, they don't want to intervene the, every country the sovereignty. So the most uh, representative countries it might be China.
The China always say that it's, uh, you don't want to intervene their sovereignties, they just want to help other people. That is kind of a cloud-sourced cooperation project. Ideology is by China. But Taiwan, I think that is another kind. That is, we follow up the Paris uh, declarations, we follow up the Akhtar uh, declarations. The Paris declaration is to try to tell the importance of the ownership, importance of the, the effectiveness, importance of the mutual accountabilities, and cooperate with the transparency, that kind of the key principles for the A development. Okay. So what I say, how to understand this kind of the Taiwan ODA in transition? I think the most important thing is that is the way to respond to Taiwan democracy. The democratization in Taiwan is about the 30 years or the 40 years already. And we have the, a lot of, because of the democratization, so we have the regular elections, we have the freedom of the media, we have the uh, judicial independent systems, so on and so forth, and the rise of the civil societies. So number one, we are asking more effectiveness, we are asking more transparency of the foreign aid policies. So because of that, so we have the, the first uh, law uh, on the Taiwan International Development Cooperation uh, Act that is about uh, to be legalized uh, by the end of the 2000, maybe 2009 or 2008, okay. And then there is the ICDF, the International Cooperation and Development Organization, the foundation. ICDF also has been reorganized and become much more transparent become much more young generation. The average age of the ICDF right now is, 20, is 41. It's the average age. So it means a lot of the really young employees are right now working in ICDF. So they have the new ideas, and they also use their own money for the humanitarian aid projects. So that is a part, one part. The other part is the rise of the civil societies in Taiwan. As you might know, uh, the Taiwan is much uh, vibrant civil society uh, countries in Asia. And so we have a lot of civil societies, uh, not just only interested in domestic affairs, but also interested in international affairs, <laughs> particularly for the certain kind of humanitarian or the disaster crisis that happening in the whole world. So you can see that Taiwan uh, NGO is actually very active in the NAPO disaster, post-disaster construction. Also, uh, for the certain uh, kind of the typhoon, for example, Haiyan typhoon in Philippines, there is the rescue project also uh, happening by Taiwan organizations uh, in there. And the last case is I just show you about the Jordan. It's actually Syria of uh, humanitarian crisis, the uh, refugee crisis. Taiwan also played certain kind of role over there. So that has a certain kind of the importance of the rise up of the civil society. So we participate more in international affairs. And that also cooperates with the Taiwan MOBA, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and then the ICDF together to do more jobs in non-alliances, diplomatic alliances countries. And the most important thing from here is the democratization in Taiwan, not just only for the more participation in the domestic affairs. In the international affairs, we are looking for the recognitions. But used to be the Taiwan looking for the more diplomatic alliances, uh, they recognize Taiwan and they can speak up of the Taiwan in the United Nations as one of the highlights about the Taiwan uh, status. But right now, it's a little different. It's looking for cooperation opportunities with the other countries with the United Nations organizations, with the United, United States agencies, such as the Mercy Corps, with the, the French organizations, such as the Asian Against the Hungers. And we're looking for that in order, to, in order to, to highlight the important role of the Taiwan in the international affairs system. And we see that is the friendships, not just only with the other uh, South, global South countries, but also with the global North countries, which what I call about the OECD countries or the ODA countries, such as that. Okay. And that is the Taiwan ODA and uh, NGO is in Jordan. After the Taiwan uh, initiated some projects in Jordan by the MOFA, and then they also invite the Taiwan Foundation of the Children Care 
Jiafu Ji Jinhui established their own branch in Jordan. That is the first time the Taiwan organization organized and then established the first development agencies installed in the countries as a local open office. So you can see that the Jiafu TFCF right now they can meet regularly in Jordan with some other development agencies uh, officers. They can meet regularly and they can discuss some of the important issues about the refugee uh, development and so on and so forth. So become very important, they cooperate together in Japan. Okay. So I think that is a certain kind of the become the bilateral because the most important thing is to maintain the diplomatic relationships. And then there is called about the backing bonus. I offer you money, but backing for your international recognitions. But right now it's different. The different in the sense that they are become the go to the more countries rather than diplomatic alliances, and then they cooperate with a lot of other organizations, and then they are promoting the idea that <laughs> Taiwan actually is a part of the global leader, global partnerships, and then Taiwan can really help with the other countries, and Taiwan can help other countries with the Global South organizations or Global South countries. So in that sense, actually Taiwan is not small. Taiwan in terms of the G20, you can see many definitions to say Taiwan is really not small. In terms of the GDP per capita, in terms of the GDP parity, parity, parity in terms of HDI, in general population, it's really not small. So I think that is the, the idea is that Taiwan try to look for certain kind of the new recognitions, not just only friendship with the diplomatic alliances, but also try to look for the more opportunity to cooperate with the global South organization and countries to help the whole world. I think that is the most important part for the Taiwan understanding of the Taiwan ODA in transition. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Bryson. Uh, I think Joza, I think you did a fantastic job in sort of highlighting this transition from the previous model to a new model. And I think what you were also suggesting, which I found the most interesting, is a is a Taiwan model, perhaps, of Taiwan's the, the, the development assistant. And it would be great to sort of really sort of add more flesh to what you think that might, that model is. Mm -hmm. And I, you, you touched on it, but I think there's a lot that, uh, more there in terms of uh, that we could perhaps go into in the discussion. Um, Scott, over to you. Thank you, Russell. Uh, let me just start by saying thank you to GTI. Uh, let me also, on behalf of Rand and my co-authors, thank Tecro, who funded this study. Uh, I'd like to thank Dr. Cronin, who helped us uh, think through some of the issues when we got close to the end, uh, and also thank ICDF, as you mentioned, mm -hmm. and, and also the Pan American Development Foundation, both of which were integral in providing us data and helping us understand the texture and the, the shape of Taiwan's assistance. Uh, across Latin America and the Caribbean, a region uh, that we unfortunately did not have an opportunity to visit for directly for this research, so we had to rely on some uh, some aid and assistance from Taiwan of our of our own uh, in the form of data. Um, let me just start with a, a remark. I think you're going to find that there's a lot uh, uh, that I'm going to echo uh, Dr. Qian on, uh, and I think that's a good thing because it shows that scholars and experts who are looking at this independent of each other are finding basically the same thing, this proliferation of, uh, of aid and assistance programs across Taiwan society, that there is a move towards multilateral uh, efforts to engage, uh, um, that there is an effort to be more transparent. These are things that uh, are being seen across the community and they do represent, Russell, I think a, a very new, very different uh, approach, especially by contrast to that of China, which is non-transparent, which is exclusively top-down, which is exclusively, we are here to give you things that are physical as opposed to transfer skills that empower a population uh, that is receiving them. And so that's where I want to kind of start my remarks today, and that is to say that um, if I could, both Russell and, and Tim Bush, uh, you both used this phrase that is the most common phrase in the discussion of Taiwan diplomacy, and that is one that I don't like very much, and that is to describe Taiwan's diplomatic partners as diplomatic allies. And of course, it's not the case that these are allies. These are countries that are reciprocally extending diplomatic recognition. I am of the view that calling them allies implies more commitment on their part. 
and also may give countries around the world the opportunity to leverage Taiwan's need or desire for recognition into a greater effort to demand that, as you said, kind of that demand side pull. Um, one great example of a country that Taiwan does not have diplomatic recognition from, uh, but that was an enormous recipient of Taiwan's civil society directed aid and assistance, which you didn't mention, Dr. Chen, but Japan after the triple disaster. Taiwan probably did more for its relationship with Japan after the triple disaster by being the number one country that donated aid and assistance to help damaged regions in Tohoku and elsewhere recover uh, than any other effort that Taiwan government or Taiwan society has made, even in Haiyan in the Philippines. So let me just start, that's kind of a, something we can chew on, but um, to talk a little bit about this issue. Uh, so Rand was asked to think about um, how might Taiwan try to counteract China's efforts to isolate Taiwan? And to narrow that down a bit, we chose to look at Latin America and Caribbean, an area where Taiwan has the overwhelming majority. I think now it's uh, eight or nine, I don't remember off the top of my head, but at the time we started the program, it was 10 of its diplomatic partners. Uh, and we wanted to look at this because Taiwan has to care about its diplomatic partnerships. Um, it doesn't have to care about them because they matter to Taiwan's physical security. These are not countries that are allies. They are not going to defend Taiwan in the case that China attacks, but they do extend a certain legitimacy, a certain sense that Taiwan is a real place with real people, with a real society that has its own identity and a right to autonomy and a right to determine its future. They allow Taiwan to participate in international society, which every people wants to be able to do. And it matters, let's be honest, for domestic politics. It has been a cudgel in the past. It probably will be in the future for opposition parties to challenge the, uh, the approach to governance uh, of the ruling parties uh, at whatever time, point in time over whether or not they've lost or maintained or gained diplomatic eyes. And in fact, at various points in time, it's been an opportunity for ruling parties to imprison former uh, officials from previous administrations over the issue of the non-transparency. And so Taiwan has gradually, as uh, Dr. Chan noted, shifted away from this kind of use of direct payments to try to buy or retain uh, diplomatic assistance to a much more socially grounded, broad-based empowerment uh, stra focused strategy. Um, so first off, it matters for Taiwan to study this issue. Second, it matters for the United States uh, because the United States cares about Taiwan's autonomy and ability to control its own destiny. Uh, and the United States also cares about the regional outcomes that Taiwan is helping to improve. Uh, many of the uh, people who care about the region would say Taiwan is doing a great job to help. Uh, some of those who see the who see uh, the region primarily as a source of problems, which unfortunately in, in the United States today, there are those who purely regard Latin America and Caribbean as areas that are troubling the United States by sending people or needing resources. Um, even those people should welcome Taiwan's aid and assistance. And I think it's, it's fair to say since our research was all done uh, within the last year and a half, across the current U.S. administration, many senior officials do value Taiwan's assistance programs in the region because of their value to the peoples of the region, but also understand that the reality of the current political situation in the United States is such that helping to try to keep people in a place where they don't need to flee, where they can live good lives in those countries may also be valued by certain individuals. And then finally, let's be honest, in terms of the U.S.-Taiwan relationship, this is a valuable region because it can facilitate stopover diplomacy. It's not the only region that matters for stopover diplomacy. The South Pacific, as we've just seen with President Tsai stopping in, uh, in Honolulu, can also be used this way. Uh, but it does provide a very reasonable expectation that, well, President Tsai is going to be flying to Latin American Caribbean, can stop to refuel on her way, can have meetings that are important and that might otherwise still be possible, uh, but might be somewhat more politically costly or diplomatically costly. Um, so that's kind of the first piece of, kind of why should we study this issue? Why does it matter? Um, what does Taiwan do? Well, we wanted to look at this and say, okay, there's eight or ten countries in the region. We can't study all of them. Uh, so we chose two in the study, and if you have an opportunity to read the report, you'll see we looked at Haiti and Honduras. Um, one of the fascinating things to me, uh, Marsha and I were just speaking beforehand. She said, what surprised you about this? I think one of the things that really uh, surprised me as a, as a Taiwan specialist, but not someone who would looked really extensively at Taiwan's relations with Latin America and the Caribbean before, is just how widespread the appreciation for Taiwan's experience across the region is. Taiwan has gone from being a poor agricultural country that was under a military dictatorship to being a rich developed country that is, as you noted, going from a donor recipient to a donor uh, to a donor and uh, has 
moved into a position where it is giving assistance on issues that really affect the region. So things like raising uh, living standards by through technical assistance to farming communities, or improving resilience ahead of disasters, or helping recover from disasters. The region, Latin American Caribbean region, suffers from earthquakes, as all of you know Taiwan does too. And the region suffers from hurricanes, and Taiwan suffers from typhoons. It's really amazing and surprising to me how many ways in which Latin American and Caribbean countries can actually look at Taiwan's experience and say, that's, that's what we want to look like. Uh, that's a country that has experiences and, uh, and skills that they're willing to share with us and that will help us live better lives. Um, and so we looked at things like Taiwan's agricultural assistance, its microfinance programs, its technology education empowerment programs, uh, its healthcare programs. And one of the things that I think it's fair to say Taiwan's approach does, and I think Russell and, and Dr. Chan have already mentioned this a bit, but it really focused on building community capacity. It is a partnership relationship, far more than the superior giving its inferior something relationship that traditional aid donation implies and that China's infrastructure focused donation necessarily results in. You know, China is going to build you a road, a, a, an airport, a soccer stadium. It's going to bring in a large Chinese company with Chinese laborers to do that. It's not going to really result in anything except the transfer of infrastructure. Taiwan's program, by contrast, works at the grassroots level. It empowers local communities. It gives them skills they didn't previously have. It ties them into the relationship in ways that do represent a bit of a challenge to translate up to the national capital, perhaps, but are certainly much more easily intelligible and understandable down to the local level. Um, so then third, we wanted to look at, well, what does this matter to the US, and how does, how does the United States if at all, uh, share in Taiwan's goals. And there the values, uh, I think, is, is obvious, right? You know, the United States is looking to have this region uh, be wealthier, be more resilient. Uh, and Taiwan might think about enhancing its own diplomatic profile in the region, or at least making it more resistant to the prospect of Beijing cutting it off by trying to synthesize or synchronize its own aid and assistance programs with US efforts even more closely and one way to do that, and we've seen this now recently with uh, the global cooperation and training framework that brings uh, some of Taiwan's diplomatic partners to Taiwan, courtesy of AIT, the United States, the American Institute in Taiwan, and it gives them an opportunity to really see Taiwan firsthand and get some benefit for their country firsthand by getting some technology or some skills transfer, uh, that that might be an appropriate uh, approach to use with Latin America and Caribbean, a region that has not focused, uh, been the focus of GCTF's efforts quite as much so far. And we've now seen third countries, and I think it's you're absolutely appropriate to mention this, Dr. Chen. Uh, we're seeing Taiwan cooperating with second with a, with a diplomatic partner in a third area. We're now seeing that extended to GCTF as a format where Japan is coming in to GCTF. Um, and so I think that's an area where we're seeing opportunities for Taiwan to perhaps increase the resilience of its diplomatic relationships by making it clear to countries across Latin America and the Caribbean that we're here, we're here supporting the U.S. efforts. If you want to have a good relationship with Washington, Washington really cares in new ways and in deeper ways and broader ways than in the past about Taiwan's profile across the region, the United States statements from everyone across the, uh, the State Department, the National Security Advisor and elsewhere have shown that the U.S. is really committed to uh, to Taiwan's profile in the world and its, and its legitimate participation in international society, I think that really helps uh, signal to countries across the region that this would be perhaps even more costly than you thought if you thought, well, who cares? Nobody else cares if I trade Taipei for Beijing. No, that's actually not true. There's a lot of concern in Washington. There's a lot of efforts to try to support Taiwan uh, in, in the region. Um, so finally, if I just turn to some uh, kind of wave top conclusions and then uh, pass the mic to Patrick. Um, I think one of, the, one of the starting points to say is that as much aid and assistance as Taiwan gives, and as valuable as that is, um, China will always have deeper pockets. And so Taiwan can't try to outspend China, so it has to spend smarter than China in ways that are more legitimate and in ways that are more attractive to the region. Um, additionally, even doing that is no guarantee, uh, because sometimes elections bring to power people who have very different agendas, and those different agendas can include 
for whatever reason, shifting recognition from Taipei to Beijing. So aid is necessary, high level attention is necessary, but it's not going to guarantee that countries across the region aren't going to change uh, their uh, relationship with Taiwan. And so the, the next piece uh, is that Taiwan needs to be sure that it emphasizes and makes itself as attractive as possible by emphasizing its broad-based, community-based approach to partnering with countries. Uh, tell, you know, Xi Jinping is famous for telling his, I mean, his subject, his uh, people, <laughs> tell a good China story. Uh, and I think it's important for Taiwan to tell a good story about Taiwan, which, it, unlike in the case of China, it doesn't require lying through your teeth. Um, you don't have to make things up when it comes to Taiwan. Taiwan does do good things in the world. Taiwan is a good country. Taiwan does help its partners. Um, and so there I think it's important for Taiwan to make it clear uh, that aid and assistance does come from Taipei, but it also comes from Taiwan, the people of Taiwan, through Taiwan's civil society. And there may be ways to expand the toolkit. You know, In this study, we looked at a very narrow slice. We looked at official development assistance and disaster relief. Um, but there are other tools in Taiwan's toolkit. There is security cooperation and intelligence sharing. There is economic trade and investment policy and other diplomatic tools that Taiwan has that could expand beyond what we simply looked at in this study, but that can help bolster Taiwan's relations with the region. Um, and I, I want to give credit where credit is due on this one. Patrick, I think if I remember correctly, was integral to pointing out to us that uh, telling a good story or doing a good job of making clear uh, that your uh, values and your engagements were, were worthwhile is not enough. Uh, we did not unfortunately have the, uh, the remit or the funds to develop an entire whole of government strategy for Taiwan maintaining its diplomatic partnerships. Um, but quite clearly Taiwan needs to be thinking beyond just aid and assistance programs. It needs to be thinking how can it maintain its relationships overall, and including probably thinking about the price point for those relationships. As many of you probably know, Taiwan's most important relationships are, are almost certainly not its actual official relationships. They're its relationships with the United States, Japan, the EU, Australia, those countries that really will be there for Taiwan. Um, but that's not to say that the official relationships are not important. Making sure that you know what does Taiwan really need from these countries and how much is it worth giving? Because sometimes, unfortunately, uh, countries will try to extract resources or trade on Taiwan's perceived vulnerability or need for their assistance or for their recognition. And Taiwan does need to be able to say at certain points in time, this we can do and that we cannot, because if we did that and it came out in our population, it would discredit the overall ODA effort. And Taiwan has certain standards that are the right standards uh, for its development assistance, uh, and it needs to abide by those and make sure that they do. Um, finally, uh, I think this is a very helpful point towards the end, um, expanding the, the venues, the ways that Taiwan assists the region, whether it's through um, in new initiatives with the United States and Japan, like the Global Cooperation and Training Framework, or multilateral giving through an organization like the Pan American Development Fund, or participating in international organizations uh, such as the, the many that Dr. Chen outlay, uh, laid out uh, are important. Uh, and that will give Taiwan an opportunity to participate, to be seen. Being seen is important for a country that's in Taiwan's position. You need to have people around the world know your story, know that what you're doing is valuable, and know that there is an authoritarian one-party communist dictatorship out there trying to absorb Taiwan and strangle Taiwan, and that Taiwan is doing the right things to try to counter that, and that it deserves support. So I'll end there. Thank you very much. Scott, that was, that, was, that was excellent. And I think your emphasis on the, you know, the particulars of the approach uh, of, experience, of, uh, of experience and, uh, and skills and partner capacity building, I think really highlights, I think, the, uh, you know, how Taiwan can really, um, you know, uh, give, give back to the, uh, to the community. And I just want to hone in on the point that, you know, uh, the point on the global cooperation and training framework, because I really do think that the, uh, the recent addition of Japan into this framework in coordinating the, a, a workshop on anti-corruption -corru uh, is really a meaningful enhancement of this initiative. And I think it, it provides a good sort of basis and, and perhaps model for how uh, the, this process, this mechanism can be further enhanced to, to focus on issues of how development assistance uh, you know, can be provided in a more uh, transparent and also a sustainable manner to the recipients. And um, 
And, uh, and then just on that note, I will also point out that back uh, in November 2018, APEC, uh, which was held in, in Papua New Guinea, also between the US and Japan and Australia, had an announcement of an MOU about how they're going to partner or on infrastructure investments. Uh, and you know, this is going to leverage private capital as well as infrastructure finance uh, to be more transparent and uh, sustainable. And you know, Taiwan is a formal member of APEC, and, and again, if we're looking at multilateral mechanisms, this potentially could be another mechanism where Taiwan can have a more, uh, again, a more effective role where it could uh, really stand to contribute. So um, I want to turn it over now to uh, to Patrick, who's um, you know provide us with his uh, as a as a former senior practitioner uh, in uh, in USA uh, to provide his reaction and also his uh, suggestions. Russell, thank you for uh, this excellent program, one of many you do here at the Global Taiwan Institute. And let me uh, commend the work of Dr. Chen and Dr. Harold, and especially this report from Rand, which really is full of a very careful analysis that is worth uh, scrutinizing. Um, Taiwan has an important global role to play in foreign assistance, and it can do that much better with uh, the support of the United States, Japan, and other actors who can help figure out the best ways to uh, have a strategic impact. Um, I could. I want to talk a little bit about just the nuts and bolts of foreign assistance and official development assistance and my own experience and then relate that to Taiwan and Asia policy. Um, we've talked already so much about corruption, so my, one of my first stories will be after I left AID, I wasn't just the number three official with AID, but I was also in charge of setting up the Millennium Challenge Corporation, which was an attempt to try to create a new aid uh, agency and it is an independent agency today within, within the U.S. government um, that focuses on big strategic economic development, uh, not small little projects that are going off in a million directions, but sort of packaging from the ground up the best practices brought out of the World Bank, uh, building uh, a real um, sort of understanding inside the recipient country, and then going forward with all those stakeholders in a transparent way. So one of the first invitations I had when I left government was from um, uh, the Swiss, um, who said they just wanted me to talk to African finance ministers privately about uh, development assistance. So I'm in, I'm in a, a room not much bigger than this uh, in Geneva, uh, but beautiful, uh, tall um, sort of uh, windows, uh, buttons pushed, and all these, so it goes dark immediately, all the shades go down, and something is like a James Bond scene. And I'm surrounded by a dozen African uh, finance ministers. I'm thinking, gee, why are they so interested in the Millennium Challenge Corporation? And I brief them about how it's going to be good governance, and it's really focused on anti-corruption because if you're not committed to good policy and anti-corruption, then you don't get Millennium Challenge Corporation. And at the end, it was clear, according to several of the ministers, they said, but Dr. Cronin, all we want to know is how can we get the Millennium Challenge Corporation funds here into our Swiss bank accounts? Um, and so, you know, if you don't think that corruption is rampant in the world of development assistance, then you really haven't been around the world to understand this. So when China's dealing in back rooms, yeah, they can cut big deals. <laughs> but when democracies that have to be held accountable to taxpayers are able to do that, no, you don't get away with that, or you don't often get away with it, or eventually it catches up with you, and that's not the way the system works. Um, and that's important because as you know, democracy, Taiwan has a great potential here to showcase the good governance issues that we talked about, the democracy and governance um, and the anti-corruption that's really important if you're going to get sustainable development and not just a showpiece sort of uh, development project as Scott was talking about in terms of the, the soccer stadium is the iconic mention of that. Um, now, foreign assistance is a policy tool, as has been mentioned uh, by Dr. Jim, and, and it's used and it's bigger than ODA. It's bigger than just uh, development assistance, as Scott made clear. Um, it, you know, development assistance, the rules for what constitutes economic growth and, and, and beneficial uh, aid to the welfare of the recipient countries is determined by that small group of wealthy countries, the OECD countries. I used to go to the meetings in Paris, drop in, and I was always angry with my European friends because they totally dominated the rules. And the United States would look to Japan finally to say, well, we got to think about Asia in this context. We've got to think about the rest of the world. No, 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 we're going to protect Francophone Africa and you know, Anglophone Africa and whatever they were, you know, our, our, and I love our European allies, but at the same time, they were creating the rules. Um, we need to make sure that Taiwan is allowed to be part of those discussions in terms of uh, the rule setting of what constitutes. But 
But foreign assistance, again, includes, as, as Dr. Harrell mentioned, uh, things like security assistance. Uh, not all security <coughs> assistance or defense assistance uh, is indeed uh, development assistance. But they're all part of the toolkit that the United States uses. Now, the U.S. Um, uses foreign assistance on a regular basis, and it uses it in 200 countries, but it doesn't use it particularly well. Um, it uses, sometimes it, it uses it well, and sometimes it uses it very badly. Um, but it's done for many different reasons um, in terms of why this is used. It's, it's obviously, first and foremost, national security uh, does dominate where most of the funding goes. Uh, and indeed, when I was in the Bush administration and after 9-11, I was in Indonesia, and we were redirecting foreign assistance for the right reason, to try to help frontline states against radicalization. And we were able to sit down, and I was able to put together uh, an informal ad hoc group with Japan and the UK on how to prioritize certain areas like Pakistan and Indonesia to, so that we do more than what we were just doing on a regular basis in order to figure out, can education help? Can we go into uh, at-risk areas and try to uh, accelerate development? Um, the same thing can be done with Taiwan, by the way. This is the kind of thing that you can, you need, you need the Asia policy team of the U.S. administration, though, to go consciously um, shake the shoulders of officials in AID and in State Department and elsewhere to say, look, we need to have a coordination group that goes beyond just the normal government-to-government -government work that's being done by OECD countries and, and, and the ongoing projects. Um, anyway, back to the foreign assistance. Um, I think, you know, the Belt and Road Initiative uh, is uh, such a great example of how China is able to shine a spotlight on its um, its public diplomacy project, its big project. Uh, so much so that in the Global Times this week, I was struck by the wonderful photo spread they had in the Global Times of the new Jakarta massive mm -hmm. rapid transit. Uh, um, and, you know, the MRT, first 14 miles just opened up. It's wonderful. They've got a subway finally in Jakarta. The second phase is starting. One thing they didn't mention in the Global Times, it's all Japan funded. It was all Jaipur <laughs> funded. It was all Japan built. Um, and, but if you read the Global Times, you probably say, well, Belt and Road, this must be China, right? This must be, you know, so they're, they're even taking credit in effect for things that they didn't do. Um, and and if, if we don't tell the public diplomacy story, um, then they'll, they'll, they'll get away with it, too. Um, and we do a very bit bad job of, of publicizing the good work that is, you know, that, that is done. And that there's opportunity here for all of us on that. Um, I think the um, official development assistance doesn't just go for national security, though. It goes for trying to deal with basic development. We do less and less economic uh, development, ironically. Uh, it was true. When I was in the Bush administration, there weren't enough uh, development economists inside AID anymore. They all fled. Uh, we built the Millennium Challenge Corporation to be a $5 billion a year organization. It never got to be more than a billion dollars, and the Trump administration is calling about 800 million requests for, for FY 2020. Um, that's a mistake. It was it was short. Um, it was held back in part because of the uh, well, in large part because of the Iraq and Afghan wars. Uh, I know. I, mean, I left because it was so frustrating that that sucked all the oxygen out of the room. And that's where most of the foreign assistance has gone. And if you look at where foreign assistance goes, it goes to you know it goes to Afghanistan and Iraq, and it's gone to Pakistan and Israel and Egypt. You know, think about Camp David Accords. Historically, that's what sucked up so much funding. But on basic development assistance. Um, health care is the big winner these days, not economic growth. But health care isn't essential. If you don't have health, you know, you're not going to have much of an economy. Um, and a lot of good work has been done in health. Um, in fact, much of it's still done through PEPFAR, which you know, is the acronym for the President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief. Um, emergency continues, and PEPFAR continues, so the emergency never ends. Um, but uh, along with other global health programs, a lot of good work is being done by the United States in terms of not just HIV AIDS, but malaria, tuberculosis, and other, other disease, um, although the request right now from the administration is to cut that back by about 30%, from $9 billion to about $6 billion a year. Um, and the third area of, uh, of growth or of development assistance um, for the U.S. government focuses um, mostly on humanitarian relief, um, disaster relief. Um, and again, we provide about $9 billion a year. The request this year was only $6.3 billion. The number of disasters is going up. There are lots of, lots of reasons why that number will go up by the time Congress finishes it. Um, but, but the point is that the U.S. is still the single largest provider of humanitarian assistance uh, as a donor. 
not spoken in those those big funding items is good governance. Building the capacity of people and institutions for ensuring sustainable economic development, which is an area where we have a common, you know, the, the democracies have a common interest and opportunity. The Trump administration, to its credits, talked about protecting U.S. strategic interests in the Indo-Pacific region as part of their free and open Indo-Pacific strategy. The budget request uh, that Secretary Pompeo has identified with Mark Green of USAID talks about $1.8 billion for economic and security assistance. That really specified exactly um, what, where all of that will go. Uh, and they're also missing something in the sense that the Asia Reassurance Initiative Act, a separate piece of legislation with bipartisan support that was passed by um, uh, authorizers uh, at the beginning of this year, still has no appropriation, still has no money. Um, there should be an obvious bipartisan uh, effort to add to this uh, sort of Indo-Pacific region that will allow us to work with Taiwan, allow us to work with others globally, not just in Asia Pacific, not just in the Indo-Pacific. Um, it will allow us to bring in government and non-governmental private sector uh, entities to work with um, on, on these issues. Um, it's, it's so important to see uh, the idea of ODA in transition in Taiwan, uh, Dr. Chen, because I think the, um, you know, the silver lining for me um, on China's uh, unrelenting political de-recognition strategy and assault on Taiwan, trying to wipe out the identity of the Republic of China, if you will, um, is uh, that it frees up uh, ODA to now think about how you can have the biggest strategic impact. Uh, and I think uh, Dr. Ho has made some very important admonitions here about how to think about you know, diplomatic partners, not allies, you know, your recipients. Um, but to think about really what you're trying to showcase that Beijing cannot showcase. Beijing can, is incapable of showcasing. And this isn't new. Go back to James Mann's book, The China Fantasy. It was written in 2007. I had to remind myself that the other day because I read it and I thought, this is brand new. Like, no, 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 this was 12 years old. You know, this is China's not a democracy and it's going in the wrong direction from where it was already. Um, but Taiwan is a democracy and it's going in the right direction. Uh, and it can go in the right direction globally with some of these issues. So uh, whether it's the disaster relief, which uh, is, is so uh, timely and in, in, in what uh, Taiwan can do, whether it's in the health area that uh, Taiwan has so much human capacity and expertise, whether it's democracy governance, uh, setting the right rules, um, whether it's in the maritime domain as well, in terms of you know, including where Taiwan could do better as most countries in the region and actors in the region uh, with illegal, uh, unreported, unregulated fishing, for instance. But there are lots of things uh, in, the, in the blue economy uh, that, that could be a special project in tandem with Japan, in tandem with the United States, in tandem with others. Um, these could be great things to showcase. But Taiwan's <clears throat> current crisis, if you will, by being uh, pressured so much by Beijing is an opportunity to counter Beijing coercion uh, and uh, with the power of ideas, vision, uh, and higher standards of freedom and accountability and transparency. So let me stop then. Well, that, 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 that was excellent. And, and thank you so much for that firsthand view and very practical, uh, you know, sort of observations and how Taiwan could fire its development assistance and matters and drawing from of course experience of the United States and uh, uh, and, and your role in uh, in that vantage point um, you know and, and, and just you know taking on your challenge of sort of the, uh, doing better sort of public diplomacy here I would just do a plug for our friends over at the State Department and AIT at TEFRA also as well especially on the governance angle of it uh, recently it was announced that the United States and Taiwan are going to launch an annual consultation on, uh, on good democratic governance. And I think that, that you know, really is a good, you know, very, uh, an important step in terms of uh, really looking at the right issues in terms of how this leverage the relationship in the matter. And, and, um, and perhaps what, you know, where, where we can all learn from in terms of your, um, your, your, your observations is that there needs to be a whole of government approach all places, you know, in Washington, in Taipei, also in terms of addressing how, you know, development assistance can be better leveraged for you know the common goals and 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 that, that we've all identified and so and uh so we have a lot of time for discussion i'm going to use my prerogative as the um as the moderator to kick off the uh to kick off our discussion um but you know do, uh, we'll leave about 15 minutes at the end for audience q a so it gives you an opportunity here to think about your questions um but you know uh, 
Christ, I'd like to start with you here. Um, you know, one of the uh, one of the you know outstanding issues that always stands uh, in, in the case of Taiwan is you know due to its special status, it's therefore it's Taiwan's ability to participate internationally. There are limitations to it, but I think what you've emphasized is that you know, Taiwan is doing a great deal already. You know, uh, in terms of how it's contributing to uh, you know, development activities around the world. So maybe you can shed some light in terms of from your vantage point in Taiwan. Uh, what you know? What limitations are there in terms of how Taiwan can contribute internationally due to this special status that Taiwan could, wouldn't otherwise be able to, right? I mean, are there ways in which Taiwan could contribute more right now, but due to the way that Taiwan's treated, perhaps you know, in, in terms of uh, you know because of the special status that it's unable to do right now, and I think maybe that would be an interesting you know I think um, uh, observation again from you in terms of. You know, what more is Taiwan you know, willing and capable of doing? Hmm. Should we have other questions rather than also? Yeah, and also, yeah, yeah. And also <laughs> I think one of the things I want the other panelists to think about again is this cooperative uh, collaborations and ways in which we can, you know, sort of look at how, you know, um, yeah, I was at a Hudson event a couple of weeks ago and it was an attendee, and this was about the South Pacific. But I was struck by how all the participants in that, um, the speakers there, were emphasizing the need. For more, you know, so uh, uh, coordinated collaboration, coordinated collaboration, and so I want to pick up on that theme because I do think here is a point where, you know, with more coordinated collaboration, we could really do a lot more. We could leverage because, you know, I think Scott, you said it. I mean, there's just there's just no way that we can compete. Any one country can compete dollar to dollar with 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 China. I think in 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 terms of, and I could be wrong with this, statistics, but you know, dollar for dollar in terms of what China is spending. So there has to be some, I think, you know. Um, you know, sort of some be some collaboration there that, that could be more effective in ensuring, again, a good governance and transparency. You know, again, these principles and values that you know we we we, um, we are so focused on. So um, so so that yeah. So, would anyone like sort of? Take, take I, I can to react to that sure, one, yeah. if you wanted. To yeah, sure, please. Yeah, I mean, I think look. Um, so I made the remark, and maybe this is what you're picking up on, Russell, that um, that Taiwan can't outspend or can't plan to outspend China. And I do think that point is true. But I wouldn't make the argument, uh, and I'm not sure if I've understood you correctly, but I wouldn't make the argument uh, that you can't outspend China. I, I'm not sure I'm making the argument that you want to get into a spending competition with China. Um, but let's remember several things about China. One, uh, China routinely announces enormous sums of money that are never realized. And attempts to capture the soft power and diplomatic victory that comes from saying things like, we're giving Pakistan $65 billion, the Belt and Road is a $1 trillion initiative, it's way bigger than anything else. And how much is there really there, there? Uh, oftentimes it's substantially less realized investment, aid and assistance. The aid and assistance doesn't actually pan out. So like if, if China wins not aid and assistance, but let's say China wins a contract to build a high-speed railway from Jakarta to Bandung, and guess what? They underbid, and it doesn't ever get realized, or it gets realized later and over budget. There's just a lot of this there. That's point one. China does not actually always meet the marks that it announces, but it tries to capture benefits. Second, there are countries that can match them. The United States is a much richer country than China. If we wanted to, if it became a national priority, I'm not saying it should, but if we want to, remember, China is you know, what, roughly a 12, 13 trillion dollar, I have a 14, 14 trillion, trillion dollar, dollar when the United States is maybe an 18 and a half, 19 trillion dollar economy. China's debt to GDP ratio is mm -hmm. far higher than the United yeah. States. The United States can coordinate with real allies and partners, as Patrick notes, which gives us an enormous opportunity when China does things like deny the export of canola seeds from Canada, saying you should reverse your previous mistake Perfect opportunity, America, Taiwan, Japan, Australia. Let's suddenly buy canola seeds from Canada and support our allies. When China denounces, well, we're not going to send uh, you know, tourists to South Korea because we're angry and petulant about a, a ballistic missile defense against North Korea. Guess what? It's year of US tourism to South Korea. And so too for Japan. We have, this is something John Eikenberry has written about ages ago. It should not be, and it is not. United States versus China. And it is not Taiwan versus China. First of all, it's China versus those, because it's China that's trying to change things. 
Second of all, it's China versus the order that all of us agree to. Now, China has one person who can make decisions or a small, tiny you know, cohort of people at the top who make decisions. We have the harder job because we have to coordinate. The coordination problem is one that economists have studied for 70 years. Many of those economists <laughs> ran Nobel laureates, I might add. Uh, that is to say, we have to do some really hard work. But we have infinitely more resources, infinitely more legitimacy, and an opportunity to really make our liberal international order much more resilient if we're successful in doing the hard work of diplomacy and, and governance. Yeah. If I just make three brief comments. One of them, the special status for Taiwan reminds me that um, when I was at AID and we go to State Department on a regular basis, um, I had one very senior official turn to me and say, well, AID is really an NGO, right? A non-government organization. Um, <laughs> oh. And, and um, <laughs> I said a couple of things. One, it was sort of state looked at us as their sort of contract outside uh, agency as a non-NGO. Um, so there's, uh, I, I, it's funny, but it's also suggesting that in the development space, everybody essentially is working on, on development. So it involves civil society, the private sector, mm -hmm. NGOs, um, and governments. Um, a lot of the Chinese work is just G to G, just government mm -hmm. to government. Mm -hmm. So there's a great opportunity for Taiwan to be part of this space mm -hmm. in, in this. Mm -hmm. Second one is that um, it doesn't just happen, though. You have to lash up. So it's great that AIT and Tecro and others, but we need, to, we need to make sure to get integrated in, across the government. And that's tough to do. It takes a conscious political decision at a high level. Um, you know, and uh, but but there are officials who can do that. When David Stilwell gets confirmed, you know, working with Randy Sharper, working with Matt Pottinger, they could be kind of at the pinnacle of U.S. policy to kind of point and say, look, let's do some more uh, than what we're already doing. And thirdly, a lot of what um, we're talking about here, since it goes beyond <coughs> classic development assistance, is what when we're we're dealing with uh, strategic competition, is either in the realm of geoeconomics or political warfare. Um, so if you put it, it, that's why it has to be a broader discussion. You cannot simply have development professionals talking about geoeconomics and political warfare, and yet you don't want to turn all uh, development assistance into into some security tool. It's not just that, but you, you need a holistic discussion, and that again has to consciously happen. You have to force this uh, through the bureaucracy. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, thank you for uh, Russia's uh, questions. I think I would like to say that it's the question about what's the limitation of the Taiwan's model or the Taiwan's approach. But I would like to say actually Taiwan haven't expanded their full potential yet. Uh, if what we try to argue is that if we can use the NGO and then if we can to help the global society, some people who needed our help and some people who need a certain kind of development much better. But right now there's certain kind of the challenges ahead. The number one I would like to say that is the mindset of the mobile. The Ministry of the Foreign Affairs is some of that is still very focusing on the how to maintain the diplomatic uh, how, um, numbers of the diplomatic partners uh, in in their mind, rather than thinking about the development projects in their mind. So, give you some of the examples. For example, if you look at the Taiwan uh, higher universities, uh, the certain kind of the university have the the diplomatic. Uh, Department, uh, diplomacy department or the department of the international relations is very limited of this department that offer the courses about the international development mm -hmm. okay and then if you look at the course of the the people want to become the civil servant of the MOBA they need to attend in certain kind of the examinations very limited of the questions that is related to the international development projects so the the whole of the mindset and the, the whole of the training is still not that kind of yet. Mm -hmm. So even you can think of that, that in, the, the, in some countries, for example, in French, there is the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and International Development. And in UK, they do have the separate uh, organizations, the Ministry of the Foreign Affairs, and then, the, and then the, they call about the International Development Department. So, but in Taiwan, that kind of the mindset and that kind of the organization, that kind of the institution haven't really established yet. So that is number one. I think the number one challenge is that the mindset needs to be changed first. Number two is about the NGO. As we say, that a lot of the NGO actually have played a certain role very actively in the international uh, development affairs and all kinds of the issues. But 
Nevertheless, we also need to admit some of the NGO is relatively small, and not many big NGO is the full uh, global capacity to do the kind of a development project. So that is the reason why I think about if some of you are interested in, might be pay attention to the Taiwan Foundation of the Children, Care and the Family, the, the TC, TFCF. They established their eight local offices full time. Uh, employment is from Taiwan, and they are very young people. And they in in I think in six or eight countries already in Mongolia, in Thailand, uh, in Vietnam, in the Swaziland, and then in Jordan, and then in Kyrgyzstan. Okay. And those are the really new uh, development phenomena that the local NGO really established the local offices mm -hmm. outside of the, the countries and try to help doing the development of jobs. So nonetheless, you can say that uh, that is the new phenomena, but it's the only one case. But some of the, that is the reason because Taiwanese uh, NGO is really small, so you cannot work a capacity to do all kinds of the development of projects as we try to expect them to do. And then there are certain kind, and if we can finish, if we can uh, try to change the mindset of the MOBA, and we can try to help the NGO to develop the better, more capacity. And the last one is just, I think the, the certain kind of the opportunity is really ahead. Uh, for example, uh, I fully agree with the Scott that we don't really need to compete with uh, China. And actually, we can wait for China to make a mistake. <laughs> <laughs> the China always give a big promises, and to the end, the people, the countries, uh, in civil societies, uh, we recognize that, that is fully a uh, fake news, or that is the fully just um, uh, just just they just they just make a wrong thing, make a wrong decision. I give you one example is about the, in Malawi, the China cut the uh, the Malawi cut the relationship with the Taiwan a few years ago, but. One NGO is the Pindong Christian uh, Hospital. Uh, they try to send their doctors, the nurses, and then the civil uh, social workers together still in Malawi. And then they cooperate with the Norwegian Foundation because the PNG actually has a certain religion uh, history background with the, one of the doctors from Norway. So that is become another one kind of the triangle relationship between the Taiwan, Norway, in Malawi. And then the Malawi is actually appreciated Taiwan's help more than China, although China established the diplomatic relationships. So I think we can wait for China to make a mistake. And then the second one is there is the more and more actually global disaster that happening will be happening more and more. For example, financial and for example, the environmental crisis that is quite a very important example. If we face the climate changes or has a lot of extreme weather, so we and, and Taiwan can do that. Uh, for the humanitarian assistance project immediately, that's number one. The other two is a kind of a global uh, trend. At the end of the 2008 financial crisis, a lot of the global North countries actually, they are relatively spend less money in the development assistance projects. And that creates certain kind of opportunity for Taiwan to begin. This is in terms of the money, in terms of the time. Sometimes the, the, that kind of the development project just you need to accomplish that you just need a small part of the money. And in that sense, Taiwan can help in digging these kind of opportunities. But you need a very smart, very elegant, very qualified diplomats at the local areas to look for that kind of opportunities. So that is a get back to the question I said, that's the mindset of the civil servants in the in, in MOFA. Mm -hmm. If they all are looking for the very safe job that just only maintain the diplomatic relations, <laughs> then do not lose out the diplomatic relations. I think that is not working. But if they are more actively, proactively to looking for all opportunity using Taiwan's resources to help the people in the local with other uh, global North uh, countries or organizations, and then we can spend in, uh, the money more widely and more smartly, and then people can look in for us in a better way. And then by then we can see the more opportunity for Taiwan. Yeah. Thank you, Mike. Yeah. Yeah. yeah just, a, just a quick thought, Russell. Um, based on your question to Dr. Chan about <coughs> what else can Taiwan do? What are the limits? Um, and I think it's probably 
no surprise to this audience uh, of informed observers, but Taiwan has hosted uh, uh, delegations from almost every country recently, mm -hmm. all with what seemingly one one question. Uh, Taiwan is constantly being targeted by Chinese disinformation campaigns spread across social media. What is your experience? What can we learn from it? Mm -hmm. And this goes outside of official development assistance, but it is a kind of technical assistance. You know, what works and what doesn't in countering Chinese disinformation campaigns on social media? Mm -hmm. There's no country in the world that knows more about this than Taiwan. There's no country, unfortunately, that has more experience than leverage. Um, but it, I think it's fair to say we have seen Chinese interference or influence operations all around the world, uh, certainly in Australia, New Zealand, Canada, uh, elsewhere. We know that this is something that is a problem that is likely not to just fade away or get better with no treatment. This is something that's going to require a substantial effort uh, and make it worse in the future absent countries trying to proactively address it. What country in the world can best help mm -hmm. them think through that issue? What country needs to know the lessons of its own experience first and then begin thinking about how to mm -hmm. export those lessons and ensure that that kind of security cooperation or exchange of information is uh, is mm -hmm. to its own advantage. I think there you've got Taiwan mm -hmm. uh, can can really take um, uh, its, its unfortunate mm -hmm. experience and turn it to an advantage, perhaps. Mm -hmm. All right, with that, we have 15 minutes uh, for audience Q&A. So uh, please uh, state your name as well as your affiliation. And if you can direct that, uh, you're a cop. Uh, hopefully, it's a question. And uh, if it's a comment, please make it brief. Um, OK, so Jeff, Leo. Thank you. Leo uh, Bosner. Wait for the microphone. Oh, thanks. Leo Bosner, disaster researcher. My question for Dr. Chien. You mentioned that you think the Taiwan Foreign, Foreign Affairs Office should put greater attention on development. In your opinion, does the Japanese JICA organization provide a useful model that Taiwan might want to look at? I think uh, Taiwan should look into some models for sure. But JICA or the Korea, they have something can learn. But more than that, for example, the uh, uh, that is uh, some of the discussion we has been uh, raised up in society. For example, if really, for example, ICDF. Is ICBF can really become the professional organization uh, from Taiwan to help other countries. And maybe the model is about the Mercy Corp, the model is about the Asian against the hunger, that kind of the big organization. They are also start from scratch, very beginning, but 30 years ago, they are only small organizations, but right now they have become very big. But the other one is about, if we're looking at the, the, the Mercy Corp is from, they had a very close relationship with the USAID, maybe the US is uh, too big. Right. America is very big, it's one of the biggest countries. But we look at the other one is, uh, for example, the Norwegian Council. The, 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 if you see the, the Syria refugees, I, I visited some of the refugee camps over there. And the, Taiwan also cooperated with uh, some of the, the organization agencies in uh, Scandinavian countries. They are relatively small size compared with Taiwan. So actually, the model can be more just more than the Jaika or the Korea or the other one. So we should learn of their past of how they can grow up from the scratch and become really big and very influential power right now. So I think that is the, the, the summer idea. And the, the last point is about the Korea and Jaika that actually become quite promoting the kind of the international development ideas and agencies, that kind of ideas that, uh, to the societies, and that is something Taiwan really can learn. For example, the Korea, they e even sponsor the TV programs, the TV show, the the the, the soft show, uh, and to say that is a good thing. That, and they encourage a lot of the Korean young generation to join the international development projects, and they have cooperated with the big NGO. That is another very important thing. Uh, I think we can learn from their experiences. But the Taiwan right now, ICDF is still looking for the partnerships, and they are uh, they are starting to cooperate with the NGO uh, just from very recently right now. Yeah. Chris, if I may okay. just build off this question, are there any sort of uh, collaborative programs that you're aware of between Taiwan and Japan on uh, development assistance, uh, maybe ODA or non-governmental? As far as I know, not yet. As far as I know, not yet. That is the reason we are looking for 
the opportunity. But more than it's about in the in for example the Jordan case is with the Mexico. That right. so it's not yet. Okay. 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 But working working with a group like Peace Win, I mean working with a Japan NGO, mm -hmm. I think I think there have been instances where they've cooperated in conflict zones mm -hmm. at yes. a small level. But mm -hmm. yeah. small level. Okay. Well, thanks for that. All right. Garrett. I am Gerard van der Wees, I'm from the uh, Netherlands. I had a question on uh, public diplomacy and uh, visibility um, of development aid programs. I know from my experience back home in the Netherlands that governments in Europe traditionally uh, attach a lot of attention to development aid, you know, so it would be very good for Taiwan to highlight mm -hmm. its experiences <laughs> and what it is doing there, make it more visible. Uh, to, in order to have this strategic impact over the longer term in Europe. But the counterpoint to that is if you make your experience too visible, then of course that invites a reaction from the Chinese side. So how do we balance uh, visibility between those two aspects, uh, making it more visible to our good friends or people that you want to be good friends with, and then the Chinese reaction? <laughs> well, I mean, you always have to work on a couple of different levels. So you may mm -hmm. be working on a couple of showcase, showcase public um, development projects, um, and then not advertising a lot of the good governance and other things that you're doing at a lower level. Mm -hmm. So, um, and this is and this is where you need the collaboration of a lot of like-minded actors to try to pull together in an, you know across the Indo-Pacific and Africa and the Caribbean. Mm -hmm. um, you know, in the in the South Pacific, mm -hmm. um, the Pacific Island areas, there's great opportunity to work together. And if we showcase one or two projects publicly, highlight what's going on, keep highlighting that that can be a good thing. In contrast, the Chinese can get into a lot of trouble by highlighting what they're doing. Um, <laughs> you know, the China-Pakistan economic quarter. Now, there was a what well, was a very good Wall Street Journal article was we criticizing everything that's happened there. Uh, let me let me give the Chinese a little bit of uh, breathing space on this because. I mean, having worked with Pakistan um, and watched USA disappear in Pakistan, uh, it's not all China's fault. <laughs> uh, but but it's, it's just that there is no transparency with what China's doing, and, and that's a problem there as well. But they're very good at advertising the big picture of mm -hmm. what they're trying to do, that this is going to bring great economic growth. Um, you can't read the China papers these days without seeing these sort of science fiction-like pictures of the future. Um, it's sort of like 1950s America, where you know the, the, the toaster is going to save the woman you know, from having to labor in the kitchen kind of thing. Um, you know, I mean, and it's like, well, no, it's not that, not that simple, really. It's, uh, it's complicated. Mm -hmm. Right. Gentlemen in the back. Hi, I'm David. My name is Paul Lee from the Carnegie Town for International Peace, and my question is more for uh, Dr. Cronin. It's about the impact of U.S. aid policy, specifically the Trump administration's aid policy on uh, Taiwan's diplomatic relations. Uh, so the Trump administration recently announced that it's going to be cutting um, you know, aid uh, to think, Honduras, El Salvador, um, and uh, Guatemala. And you know, they know El Salvador already cut relations, uh, diplomatic relations with Taiwan, uh, but Guatemala and Honduras currently do have diplomatic relations. So what does this trend, uh, for me it seems like a, a perfect opportunity for the PRC, China to swoop in and try to bribe these countries uh, to switching diplomatic relations. So how does this trend look um, for Taiwan's remaining diplomatic relations in the future? And is it ine inevitable that uh, Taiwan will you know, continue down this downward spiral. I'm sure when President Trump announced that he was wanting to cut the development assistance pouring into those three Central American countries, he was not thinking at all about Taiwan's diplomatic recognition. <laughs> uh, he also didn't understand how the development assistance was delivered. And so this is a bigger point. This is not just President Trump. This is every <laughs> president, every administration. The difference between policy pronouncements in Washington and what happens on the ground around the world two very different worlds and things. And in the development assistance world, because there are so few uh, countries and donors, big donors that have major technical assistance providers, even AID has become more of a, a collection of managers to some extent than technical assistance providers on the ground. That's not entirely fair of AID, but, but over compared to where they were before, it's, it's still a true trend. 
Um, in, in the case of uh, the assistance, it doesn't go just to governments. It goes through programs. It goes through all those stakeholders on the ground. You have to find good partners. And what's happening in Central America is indeed going through partners. It also is long term. Um, and it's also done at a resource level that's never meant to provide a panacea. It's only a patch. It's only a partial you know, improvement on the situation. Um, and that may not be satisfactory, but it was deemed better than nothing. You know, I, I, I side with Representative McCall, uh, who argued this week at the Wilson Center, that um, there's a very good return on investment on that development assistance being spent. But I also understand what President Trump has done is not that different from what a lot of uh, administrations want to do, which is they want to have political control in the short term over money and funds that are committed for the long term. Mm -hmm. When I first got to AID, I was told by my staff, when, by the way, Dr. Cronin, you can't touch any of those funds for 20 years, but after that, you could start to have an impact. You know, <laughs> well, you know, that's not what the White House wants. You know, they really want to have an impact now. You, you have to do some of both, you know, is what you want to make sense. You know, we don't want to give an opening, is the short answer to uh, anybody who might be trying to hurt uh, a friend like Democratic Taiwan. Um, but, but obviously the issue in Central America, as it was related by the president's uh, sort of reflexive uh, judgment, not necessarily yet final policy, by the way. In the development world, there are many stakeholders. Congress has a huge role to play. These things take time. Um, so let's watch this space. Um, but it was clearly an expression from you know, the chief executive of the United States that um, he wanted to send a signal, uh, a policy signal, whether that has the right effect or not. Uh, I'm skeptical. Mm -hmm. Any more questions from the audience? Show me. This will be the last question. This is Sinclair from Britain, for the government of the population. And I have a two questions. First question is uh, so ID see mm -hmm. handles all uh, official government assistance uh, for uh, Taiwan or other uh, agencies. The second question is what kind of instrument uh, this initiative has uh, only providing grant or technical assistance or providing equity or providing loan? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, the ICTF, I think, is uh, spending about 50% uh, of the, the ODA, okay? And then the 80% is managed by the foreign the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And then the ICBF, they do a lot of jobs, including the technical assistance, including the, uh, the, the loans, including the education programs, but also including the humanitarian aid projects. So I think that is the overall pictures of the, 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 the aid landscape in Taiwan. Yeah. So with that, I think uh, we'll all agree that we had a very uh, interesting and fruitful discussion today. Uh, if you haven't picked up your copy of uh, uh, Scott Harrell's uh, report. Please do so. I think we still have some copies available in front. Uh, and last but not least, let's join me in well, uh, thanking our, our panelists today.